to read a little bit from the greatest master, my goodness, the Sheikh de la Sheikh, the Sheikh of Sheikhs. <laughs> Why did you read the thing, the circle, what? the circles? The Ibn Rabi's cosmology. <laughs> We're reading a little bit about his circles. The circles of Wujud, chapter, in chapter 360, whatever that is. The Sheikh provides an explicit description of the cosmos as a circle. He begins the chapter by explaining that... Hmm explaining that necessary being is sheer light. Hmm. And the impossible thing is sheer darkness. And the possible things stand between light and darkness, sharing in the attributes of both. He refers two various ways in which people employ the terms light and darkness as metaphors. But then he explains how the cosmos, which is a circle, stands between light and darkness. The center point is sheer light. The, see, now the center is sheer light. The space outside the circumference is sheer darkness. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense, actually. The circle itself is light mixed with darkness, he and not he. So if God is light, right, and then the not part, if he's not there, then it's not he. People use the names light and darkness metaphorically, so the two are well known in common language in the manifest domain. They speak of the light ascribed to flashes of white stars, lamps, and so on, of witnessed and known darknesses that are perceived in the manifest domain by sensation. The lights of the supersensory non-manifest domain, such as the light of reason, the light of faith, the light of knowledge, and the darkness of manifest domain, such as the darkness of ignorance associating others with God and the unintelligible. They also speak... Uh, of what is neither darkness nor light, such as doubt, conjecture, bewilderment, and consideration. So something can be neither light or darkness. Uh -huh. but, neither known nor the known. but in fact, none of these terms refer either to darkness or to light. All are metaphors of the realities of the necessary, the impossible, and the possible, and the common language of the possible things. The possible, the possible things, thing brings together in itself its own reality and the reality of its two sides. This appears most clearly in the meanings, the sensory objects and the imaginal things that are found in the possible realm. The property of this duality is found only in the possible realm, never in the two sides. This is like exercising my voice here. <laughs> This vocal exercise. Yeah, knowledge of the possible realm is all is an all embracing ocean of knowledge that has magnificent waves within which ships flounder. It is an ocean that has no shore save its two sides. About its two sides, one should not imagine what is imagined by those rational faculties that fall short of perceiving this knowledge, like right and left in respect to what stands between them. Affair is not like that. On the contrary, if there is to be an uh, imagining, there is no escape from it. You should imagine what is nearest in relation to what we have mentioned, which is that the affair in itself is like the center point, encompassing circumference, what is between them. Okay, the point is the real. All right, he's saying the center is the, the real. All right. Or maybe a point in the circumference. No, a point is the real. The space outside the encompassing circumference is non-existence. So, hmm. Or call it darkness. And what stands between the point and the space outside the circumference is the possible thing. Oh, that between the circumference and the point is a possible thing. Like the image we have drawn in the diagram, figure six. Hmm. We have indicated a center point because it is the root of the wujud of the circles encompassing circumference. The circle has become manifest through the point. In the same way, the possible thing becomes manifest only through the real. <laughs> when you suppose that lines extend from the circle's center point to the circumference, these reach and end only at a point, so the whole 
circumference has a similar relation to the point. This is God's words, and God is behind them, encompassing, and his words, he encompasses everything. Each point of the encompassing circumference is the end of the line, and the point from which the line extends to the circumference is the beginning of the line, for he is the first and the last. He is the first of every possible thing, just as the center point is the first of every line. Hmm. That which emerges from the wujud of the real and becomes manifest from the real is the non-existence that does not accept wujud, and the lines that emerge are the possible things. From God is their beginning, and to God is their end, and to him the whole affair is returned. For the lines end only at the point, hence the first in the -ness of the line and the lastness of the line pertain to the line, slash, do not pertain to the line, say, whichever you like. Do you understand this? <laughs> I'm just a two-bit reader. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a... I'm just a reader. I, he's too smart for me. I can only read it. Mm -hmm. Hence the firstness of the line and the lastness of the line pertain to the line slash do not pertain to the line. Say whichever you like. Oh. Hmm. This is too abstract. It's good you have an abstract mind. <laughs> <laughs> Such things it can appropriately say, they are neither he nor other than he, like the attributes in the view of the Asarites. He, quote, he who knows himself, unquote, in this manner, quote, knows his Lord, unquote. This is why the lawgiver turned you over to knowledge of yourself and knowledge of God through his words. We shall show them our signs, which are the signifiers unto the horizons and in themselves. Hence, he did not leave aside anything of the cosmos, for everything of the cosmos that is outside of you is identical to the horizons, which are the regions around you, until it is clear to them that it is real. Nothing else, because there is nothing else. <laughs> God, I don't understand this. Uh -huh. <sighs> this is why the line is composed of points. You will not understand it rationally except in this manner. The surface is composed of lines, so it is composed of part points. And the body is composed of surfaces, so it is composed of points. The furthest limit of composition is the body. In the body is eight points. Uh, my God. This could be interesting if you could get an understanding of it. Though so he's speaking, I think he means a metaphor. No, he doesn't it. Nothing is known of the real except the essence and the seven attributes. They are neither he nor other than he, so the body is not other than the points, and the points are not other than the body, nor are they identical with the body. I say that eight points are the least of the bodies because the name lines, name line arises from two or more points. The root of the surface arises from two or more lines, so the surface may arise from four points, and the root of the body arises from two or more surfaces, so the body they arise from eight points. Thus the name length arrives newly for the body from the line, the name width from the surface, and the name depth from the composition of two surfaces, though the body stands on triplicity, just as the conformation of proofs stand on triplicity. In the same way, the root wajud, which is the real, wajud is the real, becomes, wajud means like truth or something, becomes manifest through bringing into existence only from three realities, his heness, his face turning, and his word. It's like God and the music of the spheres. Uh -huh. I don't know what face turning is. Uh -huh. His word. Hmm. 
cosmos become manifest in the form of him who gives it existence in both sensation and meaning. It is a light unto light, and the darkness above a darkness, standing contrary to every light, is the darkness, just as standing contrary to every wujud is a non-existence. If wujud is necessary, the necessary non-existence is its contrary. If, and if wujud is possible, the possible non-existence is its contrary. So the contrary is in the form of its contrary, like the shadow and the object. Hmm. In another chapter of Futahat, I think, I don't know, this is from a book, Futahat, the, the Sheikh now we're talking, Ibarabi provides a more complicated diagram of Wajud based on the relationship between the center and the circumference. In this context, he sees Wajud not in terms of a single circle, but in terms of a series of intersecting circles and semicircles. Here he provides us with a classification of the existent entities in respect of the wujud. We shall return to our examples of uh, such classifications shortly. We were reading about the, the circle. We were reading about, look at this. Wow, we're reading Ibar Rabbis with William Chittick. I don't understand it. Do you have any comment? Uh -huh.